Hello, can you hear? Okay, welcome. Welcome to our second dialogue series. As you know, some of you who came last time, uh, we started this dialogue series as a sort of a safe space for people to share their experiences so that we can connect with each other a little bit more. Um, this is the first time I'm moderating and I'm supposed to be moderating it every single time, but given I was a presenter last time, so Joe was very kind enough to, to do this. So today we are going to actually have um, a presentation by one of our, three of our colleagues, uh, JP, Ad John Paul Adam, we are so fond of calling him JP. <laughs> As you all know, he's the director of TCND. Um, and I think many of you would know that he is leaving us to, for greener pastures in about two weeks. <laughs> uh, so it's good. And he has a wealth of experience and, 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 and stuff to sh share with us. So JP is going to start off with his. Um, the one thing that's going to be common among all three of them, besides the fact that all three are very young, uh, as you can see, um, is that they are going to be introducing something called uh, implementing a new agenda you know, how change management can take place through their own personal experience. And this is just so that you can, you know, you'll be able to see how things can happen, how you can make things happen, some things you might actually have experienced in your life. So something for us to connect to. Um, without further ado, let me actually just give it over to Jim. 
Thank you very much, uh, Shweta, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And thank you also to Deka and Ling for agreeing to, to join me in this discussion. Uh, I have to start with a correction. I don't think I'm going to greener pastures, but I'm going on to new developments. Um, and I, in fact, the theme that I'm going to be discussing, because it's about uh, change management, and, and it's it's uh, really about how to manage that change, how to implement from my own experiences and some of the not so good lessons I learned the hard way, as well as some of the, the things that I've learned to be able to implement going forward and for a uh, for a reflection on what are the what are the the marks of success the the pointers that really allow successful change management to happen and i will be referring to my experience as a minister of foreign affairs i i'm actually not very young anymore uh, <laughs> i'm not i'm not very young anymore but i was privileged to be appointed uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Seychelles at the age of 32, which is also not necessarily a young age, but for foreign ministers, it's unheard of. And at the time that I was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Seychelles, I was the second youngest in the world at that time. And I was the youngest in Africa by, I think, a generation. <laughs> so um, there was a, a minister at that time of, uh, I think it was Moldova, who was who was very young at that time, and and there were, there were a couple that are, were around my age, but uh, I was uh, privileged to have that opportunity. And what I want to talk to you about is a little bit that that uh, that process of how I came in with certain ideas, how I was able to implement certain ideas, but how I was open as well to reassessing what I thought maybe were the priorities uh, in terms of then. A, is implementing something which was ultimately uh, more successful. And I have to give a little bit of a, a backdrop. Maybe I just need to be keeping an eye on the time so that I make sure that my uh, timing... So I, I, I would aim to take around 10 minutes and then interaction and then hear from, from the others. And, and I really am happy to have uh, uh, Deka and Ling because I think they will speak also from their own experience um, in different settings. But I think it will be interesting to hear and... and uh, uh, I think that in the United Nations, generally, we we sometimes struggle, I think, to engage with young people. Uh, and uh, I think the environment that we need to think about, um, there are a couple of aspects that we have to keep in mind. And, and uh, that includes on how we manage our own internal change management processes. So firstly, a little bit of context um, from Seychelles at that time. And so I was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, on the... 10th of June, 2010. And Seychelles had just gone through a very, very difficult, or was still in the process of undertaking a very, very difficult economic reform uh, as part of an IMF program. Uh, Seychelles had, uh, had a huge uh, financial crash as part of the 2008 financial crisis. Some of you may remember Lehman Brothers, uh, and uh, just in 2007, so one year before the crisis, Seychelles had issued a, uh, a $200 million bond, which was bought by Lehman Brothers. Uh, and Lehman Brothers had also invested, for example, in the tuna cannery in the country. And when all of these problems in 2008 happened, uh, the economy essentially fell apart. Uh, and there was a huge debt burden, which had accumulated over a number of years, but it was a point where Seychelles went into default. So there was, and prior to becoming the minister, I had worked in the office of the president um, as an advisor to the president during that period when we were undertaking the reform from 2008 to 2010. And the reform was, was very successful, but it was difficult. It was very successful in the sense that very quickly we solved the balance of payments problems. Um, there was a, a, a huge black market for, for dollars because there was a shortage of foreign currency. And we solved that probably within about six months. But the issues of inflation, uh, the challenges of, of uh, uh, low wages relative to the, the cost of living um, were being keenly felt by the, by the population. And it was in that context where uh, I became Minister of Foreign Affairs and at a time where uh, Seychelles had actually closed all of its embassies apart from two as cost-cutting measures. 
and there was a, a sense of um, uh, there was a very low morale generally in the diplomatic service, and uh, it was a situation where um, my appointment was greeted with a mix of, in some cases, optimism, uh, but in some cases uh, there was a lot of also thinking that uh, can he really deliver? And I remember my my hearing in the National Assembly, so the equivalent of of Congress, uh, where uh, I think my youth was attacked on several occasions. Uh, as one of the reasons why I would not necessarily prove to be a good Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now, another slight piece of information that you need to know is that uh, I had previously served as a career diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Seychelles up until 2004, before I'd gone to work for the presidency. So I felt like it was my home. I knew a lot of the people there. But that baggage was both an advantage, because I knew a lot of what was expected in the ministry, but it was also it also meant that there were some um, there was there was some shall I say uh, concern among some people who were perhaps feeling that uh, the agenda I would come with uh, would not necessarily fit into their expectations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and also at that time, keeping in mind Seychelles is a very small country, um, it's uh, about a hundred thousand people. Uh, at that time, it was also about the same population. And it's the smallest country in Africa. And the general rule of thumb of how we were implementing our foreign policy was this uh, strategy adopted by a large number of small states, which is friend to all and enemy to none, uh, which is not a bad strategy. Um, and that essentially means that on quite a few of the big issues, uh, Seychelles would abstain. Right? And we, we all know how challenging this can be in the current environment where everything is essentially you're in one camp or another. Uh, and the, um, I came in with the, the point that, yes, we have to be very careful. We have to maintain this idea that we should not create enemies, but we also need to have a principle-based foreign policy. Uh, and this was, and I did, I did face quite a lot of uh, pushback from some very seasoned diplomats who uh, who had a lot of experience um, and uh, uh, who who ha ha they uh, they call it the strategic flu um, when there's a very difficult a very difficult vote in New York you have the flu that day so you don't turn up right and this is a a strategy used um, very uh, largely by a large number of small island states and I came in with this idea that. Firstly, we are we're going to abandon this idea of the strategic flu because we have to have a position on everything, and we have to be able to defend our position on everything. And that that uh, uh, that decision around how we take those positions uh, must be grounded in our interests, real politic, uh, and that means accepting the issues and the practicalities of economic dominance of certain powers and engaging with them. But it also means that on certain issues, we have to adopt a very strong uh, principle and that will actually strengthen our position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those countries with, with whom we may have very good relationships, but on certain issues, we will not necessarily be standing on the same side of the aisle as they are, but we have to be prepared to, uh, to, to stand our ground and, and then uh, defend our position. Now, this also meant, um, in terms of the strategic thinking that the ministry was having at the time, I would I would also characterize our foreign policy previously as being uh, a fairly reactive policy, meaning that uh, we would essentially adopt positions in relation to where we felt we should be on a particular issue. And I tried to change that in the context of what are the, the, the issues that will allow us to best represent uh, ourselves on the international scene? And we had this series of brainstorming that I, I, I did with all of the, the, the officials of the ministry. Again, the advantage of being small, there were about 100 employees, uh, and it's something I could do relatively quickly, effectively, and also as a group. And uh, we, we were thinking in terms of what
there is a danger when you have large numbers of African leaders going to these conferences and they're all saying the same thing. And it is all along the lines of, we have contributed the least to climate change, but we are suffering the most. And that point is extremely valid, but it doesn't actually move the debate forward. And everyone says yes, and we agree, but it doesn't actually change the narrative. And what I wanted to do was to put forward a more positive orientated foreign policy, which addressed the issues of climate, which was grounded in our interests as a country, uh, but which also was aiming at fundamentally understanding what were the interests of Seychelles. And this is where the focus came very much on this on the subject of the blue economy. Uh, and because the blue economy was a way of conceptualizing economic development around the main resource that we had, which was the ocean, uh, and looking at that as an advantage and not a disadvantage, and as a way of both building resilience against climate change and as a vector for economic development. And uh, when we started talking about the blue economy, I remember the first few times, because this, this conversation around the blue economy started um, around Rio 2012, if some of you remember, uh, which was the Earth Summit uh, plus 20. Uh, and the, uh, in that discussion, uh, there was a lot of discussion around the green economy. And some island countries started to talk about the blue economy, because obviously in an island country, uh, the, the way that the green economy was encapsulated around agriculture had perhaps less immediate relevance. And the blue economy was a way of saying, well, yes, this is about a sustainable economic model featuring our core resources and protecting those resources and advancing it. And what I, uh, what I intended to do was to have a foreign policy which is essentially encapsulated in this idea because it allows you simultaneously to project your limited advantages that you have as a very small country, engage with other countries that have similar strategic interests, and deal with the most pressing uh, challenge that we faced, which was climate change, and it still is climate. We, we did manage to really um, generate strategic thinking on this matter. And the big breakthrough, um, which, uh, which I pushed, and I was very, Joe actually remembers this, Joe Atamensa reminded me the other day uh, at the African Union in 2013, when we were debating Agenda 2063. And there was a lot of debate, and we had to do a large amount of lobbying to get the concept of the blue economy adopted into Agenda 2063. And as we all know, it's there. And there is even the blue economy strategy, which ECA, uh, was also instrumental in uh, in, in pushing uh, in, in terms of the the actualization of of that document. And so, going back to the point about uh, change management, I'm putting it in the context both of internally within the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Seychelles, where I had to get everyone. Uh, Economy. And uh, getting that um, understanding internally within the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was, um, I did invite, the, I invited everyone to actually say, well, what, how do you see this happening? And why is it relevant? And we got lots of different answers. But the point was that at the end, we had a common goal on what we wanted to achieve. Uh, and I think that is one of the most fundamental aspects of, um, of change management and is the goal setting process. First idea was just to be more assertive in terms of our foreign policy. And then I realized that that was not enough because just being saying, saying we're not going to be just, uh, we're going to abandon the strategic flu is not enough, right? People understand that, but they don't understand the why. But when you, when, you, when you actually try to situate it in a, a common understanding of the direction of where we're going and the goal setting, and I think that's the, the key point that I would illustrate, that I would underline today, is how you set goals, which 
can, which starts in, in a sense of a uh, maybe a very personal idea, but then to translate into something bigger, there has to be that openness in terms of how others contributing towards that goal setting. So that the goal that is actually set is a common one. And the same, so just to conclude, because I, I no, 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 it's okay. I, I, in, in terms of my planning, in, in terms of my planning, this is where I want to more or less uh, end up. So we've looked at the, I've mentioned that sort of change management within uh, an organization, in that case, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, but that same change management process was one that I also took in terms of our international diplomacy and certainly in the lobbying in the African Union, in terms of how to uh, engage on the blue economy as a strategic dimension of Agenda 2063, was that, uh, again, the Agenda 2063 is about the transformation of Africa's economy. And so the elements that are in there are about what are the tools to achieve that. And what really resonated was when I simply, which then resonated with every other country. And I said, think about, and a lot of African countries, even to this day, don't necessarily think about it enough. But I think certainly Agenda 2063 and the Blue Economy Strategy has changed a lot of that. But the point was, who is fishing in Africa? Who is exploiting the marine resources? And in almost all of the countries, the major tonnage of fish landed are by distant fishing nations, not by African countries themselves. This was common to Seychelles, and it was common even to big countries like South Africa, Morocco, and it was something that everyone, uh, everyone understood and could relate to directly. Even in countries that had strong fishing cultures, industrial fishing is dominated by, by uh, external partners. And again, the real value often is also, and we see this with all extractive resources across the continent, um, the value at extraction in Africa may bring some value, but then when it's, uh, when it's, uh, when value addition is brought in and often in different parts of the, of the globe, uh, you see that the amount that Africa is retaining is actually a very small part of that value chain. And that really resonated. And so in terms of the, the, the change management aspect also in terms of international diplomacy was to get a common understanding on the core of the problem. Uh, and when we understood this, then that was much easier than to then set the strategies moving forward uh, and having a shared understanding of where we wanted to go. So these are just a few um, ex experiences I wanted to share of, of how to undertake change management. Uh, Coming from the so the, the 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 other aspect which I did mention at the start was my relative youth, which was uh, something which, uh, as I mentioned when I was going for the confirmation in the National Assembly, was uh, really used. Uh, that they should also be supported in institutions uh, so that, because they will come with crazy ideas sometimes. And the, the key element is how to achieve that strategic change on the basis of common goal setting and which ultimately everyone buys into. Thank you. So, thank you so much, uh, JP. I mean, like, you know, I think one thing that caught my attention, what you said, and I'm going to dwell on it because I want to give the floor to Deca and Ling before we open it to Republic. When you said it's a good idea to have a position on everything. I know just because you're a small nation doesn't mean that you don't have a position on anything. You have to just take it, everything as given. Um, and I also feel that Africa should be the same way, even when we are arguing for a G20 seat, it shouldn't be that we should be arguing about just our own interest. It's like we should have a position on everything, like, you know, who should actually be owning these weapons of mass destruction or not and all sorts of things. So I think um, it's a very good good point that you made. Um, now I, I'll hand over to Deka, who's going to talk about change management um, in, in her own way in the private sector. So over to you, Deka. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sweta. And thank you, uh, GP, for sharing your own experience and for you for being here to um, discuss with us and uh, and reflect on whatever we're going to share. Um, I took note of a few words that uh, really um, speaks, speak to me and my own experience. Uh, let me um, 
I would like in my case to maybe uh, share with you my experience in the private sector, which is a different environment, uh, I would say with its own challenge, but also maybe uh, opportunities that are specific for, uh, for it. And uh, I spent about uh, the first nine years of my experience, my, my career, uh, working in the private sector. It was really enriching because I started at the laboratory scale in research and development center, where I really enjoyed uh, working on innovative way to extract valuable elements, rare earth, uranium for um, those it, uh, that know. And it was really interesting. Well, that lasted for the five first years of my experience. I was at my early 20s at this time um, yet. And then I have been I have been offered the opportunity to um, bring this uh, the most innovative process I suggested at this time to the industrial level at uh, uh, the, the biggest scale, and that was really the experience I would like to share because that's when really I faced the first um, new agenda to implement by myself, and uh, it has been quite easy when I started because I have been very academic. That was the way I used to work. And I started by going through, uh, well, what was required um, in terms of techniques, equipments, uh, staff skills. But uh, then once I presented this to the team I have been offered to work with, we were at this time 42 uh, people. Many of them aligned with uh, the phase timeline I suggested, the option I offered, but few. Uh, because it would be too good to be true, but a few were really reluctant. And they literally told me just um, how, uh, at this time it was a global company, but uh, I was based in France. So just please imagine uh, in the middle of center of France in a small village uh, where uh, the average experience time spent in this company was 20 years out of these 42 people. So I was the youngest, I was the only black, and the only African coming joining. And out of 42, we were three women. Um, so, and a woman, of course, <laughs> I could have started by this. So uh, I have, like I was really standing on my standard saying, yeah, I know what I'm really offering here. And I worked so hard on it for five years that I was sure of the solution I was offering. But then I have been backlashed and saying that we are not, willing to move on this direction. And that's where really I think I, I had to um, go on my own self-reflection and go back and rock again, um, uh, asking myself what I missed in this course. And it was interesting at this time, I discovered that two thirds of any uh, change um, initiative, change management initiative in the corporate side were uh, used to fail tutor, it's the majority of them. And I, I discovered at this time that um, the most common factor is the fact that we always, um, we often, let's, let's say that um, sideline the people, the, the human resources, the men and women working in this organization. And that's where I just stopped and looked at, well, those people are the one leading, doing the, the work I'm suggesting. And let's look at what are their obstacles and how could we work together? And that's where I started to um, the consultation process. And at this time, because I was also very young, I, I, uh, I moved, I returned to a one-to-one -one, one -one meetings, just asking people about what they were um, resistance based on, if we could try to rationalize it and how could we go together through it? And it was interesting because many of the work that came back was about fear of change. Why do we need to change? Um, we are already, already doing good. So aren't we taking the risk to the situation to be more bad than it is currently? So we have been through all these points. So I um, summarized it into a presentation. And then we, we had a workshop where we spent almost two days working together as a team. And going through each of the obstacles we were uh, expecting and how could we solve it together as a team. So, and we agreed that we will have a continuous process where we will, um, and accepted this, I committed that every two
human-centered uh, approach, and how also I try to um, create a common value shared. You have at the corporate level, even institution level, you have the values and behaviors we used to uh, we used to adhere to once we joined this institution and organization. Uh, beliefs and how can we make sure that we make it alive on a, on a daily basis? Maybe to um, um, complement uh, the human factor is also the fact that sometimes uh, at this um, at this time when I, I, my project I focus it on my own mission and how um, what we are going to to deliver and the finishing end and the starting point is as important as the target we are uh, the, the ending point we are uh, reaching and just having a baseline uh, um, and engaging this process of consultation and knowing the people that are going to be involved the environment we are working in how, how um, all this complex situation would interact and be interlinked is quite was uh, very helpful and i took note of the last one but um I think those few, um, let me just look at the last third one. And also by starting with the uh, low hanging fruits also helps because we can have a very heavy uh, agenda, but if we decline it by uh, small steps, we can have some quick wins that can be delivered rapidly that can showcase some visibility in terms of improvement on a, on a daily basis. And just by starting this, we can trigger few measures and it can um, work as a domino cascade. Just to give you an idea, this project, we completed in one year instead of almost two years, uh, the piloting stage, which is the intermediary stage between the laboratory, uh, the table stage and the industrial one that is continuous and on site. it was in Gabun at this time. And we were one of the most reluctant staff member I worked at this time uh, has uh, championed when it comes to um, uh, the management, uh, the change management support, and he has been uh, awarded at uh, at the corporate level. So that was quite interesting. A few years later, to find out that it finally works, it requires a lot of vulnerability because we also need to accept that we, the, whatever change we are uh, suggesting, can fail as well. That's a risk we accept to to take, and this requires to create the proximity among the team members and with the management to make sure that we are free and we have the safe space where we can continuously try new ideas and new ways of uh, working, if it's about the process, and, and, and implement it. And just to end, um, to conclude here, I would like to say that I had the chance to work with JP during a year in TCND. And those few triggers when it comes to ensuring that we are able to work with a multidisciplinary team and um, you know different cultural background, beliefs, et cetera, and also having this people-centered approach, I really witnessed it at, uh, at a personal level. So thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Dekta, for sharing your experience, I mean, like in the private sector. What she hasn't shared, actually, after this private sector success, I mean, like she decided to go back home to, to her government, to work actually in the government. <laughs> yes, I spent six years later. I spent nine years in the private sector, then in my own government, but well, I would say that I'm very proud of what I achieved at, uh, in the public sector in my own country, because it's also a small country, a little bit bigger than Seychelles, but still uh, one of the smallest in the continent. Uh, so I'm proud of what I achieved, but I didn't benefit of the um, enabling environment I was expecting. And uh, so I, have, I faced other challenges at this, at this stage, and uh, that's why I joined the UN system later. Thank you so much. Actually, I think one thing that uh, that Deca emphasized, and it is always true, you know, when you're changing something, when you're trying something new, there is a big risk of failing. I mean, like, you know, so you have to be you, you have to accept that vulnerability that I might fail, you know, because most, not all the things work out the way you've planned, actually. So um, it takes a lot of courage to do this kind of thing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, it actually is a good segue into what Ling is going to talk about. Now. What do you
So thank you very much for having me today and uh, such a pleasure to speak up to JP and the DECA about their great experience. And just to start with, I love and hate my experience so far at the ECA because I often get to be called the young generation again. So, but it's not always easy to work as the young professional in such a big organization where you have this huge boat. If you want it to turn around, you need a certain type of authority that it doesn't exist in the title, such as the Associate Economic Affairs Officer, as you can read under my name tag. So I was having this conversation with one of my colleagues the other day, and the advice he gave me is like, whenever you write an email, copy JP, copy Oliver. <laughs> Copy Karen Gee. That's the direct answer. You how you go? I was like, is that really the way we want to go about it? Is that the only way? Like how young people can manage the change that we wanted to happen in this organization? The other day, I was looking at the archive document on the shelf of TC and the fifth floor. If you have ever been there, it's a little bit doom. And when you see the publication date was two thousand and six, you're like this can't be true, there's something wrong, we need to change. And I was like, I also opened the SharePoint folder under our division when I first arrived, sorry JP about this, it's empty, there's nothing underneath if you click through. Click harder, it's still empty. And I was like, colleagues, let's do something instead of attaching the document to each email you're sending out, let's put it on the SharePoint where everybody can click on this. And add, editing it at the same time. And the colleagues like, which link are we talking about? Is there a SharePoint? I said, yes, the UN is paying a huge money for this. Let's use it. And the colleagues are like, OK, tell me what to do. I said, I'm not really done. They actually came to me and asked me, so where can I create this link and how to insert in that email, which doesn't make me like look down upon them. I was definitely appreciating their absolute honesty. And as like, they were not afraid of exposing their vulnerability in, fraud, in front of such a young colleague. And uh, this created this dynamic and chemistry for the change to happen. So actually we sit together for like one hour maximum. And uh, I went through the everything with that colleague. And in the end, we happily reached this Link that I wanted to create it, and it was shared to all the staff in our division. And we had this document finalized within the, um, I think it was like three day maximum, and everybody could take their convenient time to comment on it. And I was like, with this result, we actually demonstrate that change was needed. So I think this is the perfect time that I go back to the definition of change management. So change management actually means it's a systematic approach to dealing with the organization's transformation in order to achieve the purpose of uh, um, implementing a strategy for more efficient change and uh, while controlling and uh, helping people to adapt to that change. So instead of being afraid, we should create this ensuring and uh, enabling environment for everybody to feel safe, to expose their ignorance, or let's call it the area of improvement inside this organization. And I can speak of my personal experience working with IT colleague who is like dedicatedly working on this session as well, like how we managed to collaborate on the SharePoint while we were working on the ARFSD, the famous African Regional Forum for Sustainable Development. And instead of sticking to the old practices that existed for the past seven years, we created something more collaborative and convenient for everyone. And it largely saved our time. And I think if we pass on the microphone to them, they can vouch for that. And to conclude, I just wanted to say, uh, let's continue pushing this process inside the UN, which is huge, but it definitely needs everybody's contribution to this change man management process. And it's definitely my pleasure to keep continuing supporting all the colleagues whenever it's needed. Thank you, over to you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. So thanks, actually. I was telling JP when you were telling your story about SharePoint, I said, I'm too old for that. <laughs> 
however i i do appreciate i think i think sophia is sitting there and she knows i mean you know she keeps pushing on the sharepoint thing <laughs> but i know it's a it's a good way to actually have everybody on board and and it's a very good example um things don't have to be you know huge to make a change i mean like we can start simple very simple things of managing our work work workflow so never think that oh unless and until i have a nobel uh, winning idea i'm not going to make that change right a change can start from anything and it change starts with us anyways so uh, let me actually pass the mark around to um the three speakers to if they want to contribute to what they've heard from others so first over to you jp no thank thank you so much and uh Deca and ling this is precisely why i thought you would uh really uh stimulate a, a great discussion and i think one thing that really um sticks with me as well is that not only in the UN, in all, I would say, probably organizations where humans are involved, uh, titles often matter too much, right? And certainly, when I was minister, that title of minister meant that automatically people will be willing to listen. And for me, it was quite striking that, you know, just a few years before, I'd been a junior diplomat, and a lot of the ideas I put forward, they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when you're minister, they listen to you, right? So, so the 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 title often we we allow titles to be to matter too much, uh, and leadership is not a title, because effective leadership involves or effective change management involves precisely a, a shared uh, approach um, of being able to uh, have a common goal. And then, and of course, there, 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 there will be debate about how to achieve that goal. But firstly, the goal setting part is important because you have to set the goal uh, uh, in, a, in an inclusive way. And then also there has to be a certain ability to uh, uh, engage on the different ideas on how to achieve them. And I, I, I sh Ling introduced me to SharePoint, right? So <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard when you're used to doing something a certain way whatever whatever age you are, I don't think even it's a, when you're used to doing things a certain way, changing it is very hard. And and uh, I think it is important. I think uh, Decker said it extremely well. You need to have, you need to embrace that vulnerability because actually that will make you stronger. Uh, the uh, There was an analogy and I forgot who used it, but so I, I, I won't be able to quote the person, but it said essentially um, when something is broken multiple times, when you fix it, you may have the impression that it's not as strong as it was. But actually, because you you know where the weak points are, when you know where your weak points are, you actually adapt to where you can and be more effective. So knowing your and understanding your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses is actually a key part, whether it be individually or as an organization, it's a key part of then uh, I think uh, adopting change. I think everything has been already said, but I really appreciated Ling's uh, uh, feedback, and I I shared the same impression when I was uh, in TC India as well. It was maybe a little bit easier for me because of my background, and maybe I'm I'm the second youngest at the, at this table, at least side of the table. Uh, I would say sharing. Uh, common goal is important and ensuring that everyone adhere to it uh, accepting also that um, anxiety will come and we need to be just open for discussion and make sure that we support the whole process and not just suggest the idea uh, request the, the, the outcomes and then leave people by, by themselves. And uh, and I think the people here already uh, share those uh, valuable inputs and it's a teamwork. So whoever has the best idea and whatever is the level, because greatest idea in the private sector from my, from my own experience did not come from the senior management, to be honest. They came from the ground. They came for the operators working on it and once you activated you trigger this uh, domino cascade as i said you can get the best of people to achieve the most innovative way and on a daily basis they used to come and say oh Deka, yesterday evening i looked at this and i found this great idea can we look can we test it on our next uh, round of uh, piloting session 
And once I had this type of feedback, I was really happy that people were fully on back in the change management. Thank you. Thank you. So to emphasize this, to start with, I think I'm really happy to be placed in a nice team with a supporting environment where our ideas are actually valued. And I think that's quite important at the start. And then, as I mentioned, like nobody should be afraid of exposing their vulnerability and should always be open and feel comfortable to talk about those changes. And then come back to the basic value of our job. All those change management that we're trying to push inside the UN is because we want to serve the people better, isn't it? As we swear into this job under the UN flag. And let's not forget about that. It's not only about like eliminating the possible um, like future frustration, it, a personal frustration if you become stagnant in a certain situation for too long. It's also the, I think the organization's future is also at stake at this stage in face of all the new Russian fast paced technologies such as chat GBT, we are aware of that, it is coming. There's a new era in front of us, so it's time for us to be ready to embrace it. Thank you. So much actually, I totally agree with you, uh, JP, a lot of the times, you know, the, nobody has patent over ideas. I mean, like, you know, and it, it doesn't come with age or whatever, anybody can have great ideas and they should be encouraged to actually voice out their opinions on things and, and be able to implement some of the changes. And knowing that they, some of the ideas are going to fail. So we really need to be strong on that as well. Um, not everything will succeed, but um, we should create an environment where people shouldn't be uh, afraid to fail. Okay, so let's uh, leave it at that. Now I'll open the floor to questions uh, for for our presenters. So who wants to go first? Unlike Joe, I don't want to call on people. <laughs> Last time Joe was calling on people. I don't want to do that. Who wants to start? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Indeed, fantastic presentation. So my question is for Decca. <coughs> Excuse me. I wanted to find out, you know, after having realized that you were the youngest, you were Black, you're a woman, what thoughts were running through your head at that particular time and how did you overcome them? And I'm asking this because sometimes when people do the same to me, I go, really? You know, so I want to find out if I'm not crazy. So I just wanted to get your own experience that. Uh, the second one is for JP. It's kind of an interesting question. So you mentioned. The, not senior, yeah, but now that you're more, maybe more experienced, yeah. I want to find out, uh, how do you interact with these junior people who come present these ideas to you? Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the question. To be fully honest, I think I was uh, afraid just because everything looks looked new for me at this time. Uh, but I accepted um, that I needed to, to go through this um, process because I had in mind uh, the main outcomes I wanted to deliver, a process that will achieve a best recovery of the valuable element we were looking in a most environmentally or environment friendly um, situation, and also helping people to work on a con in a condition that would be less risky or um, painful, let's say, when it comes to the um, daily uh, act actions or uh, gesture they need to, to, ad to adopt. But as I said, during my first presentation, I was full of confidence when I came with my new idea and I delivered in front of the whole team. And once I received this first feedback that was really um, not the one I was expecting, I just went back and reflected on it. And I think it took me a lot of energy and also like honesty to to realize and accept that something was not delivered the way it should be. And 
at least some people were had their own reason to not adhere. And I have um, I returned to the one-to-one -one meetings, and there I just sit with honesty and being the most uh, open-minded uh, possible, asking about, hey, re here I realize that from my perspective, we are not uh, going the way I expected us to go. And I, I own my own uh, part of the responsibility here, but let's sit together and look at how can we remove all those obstacles that can, um, that are uh, like um, um, forbidding us to reach this common goal and shared value. And we, we agreed when it comes to the uh, shared value, is, is everyone ready to, pro to process in a most um, in situation that will affect less the environment, we will reject less heavy metals, for sure. Uh, do you want to work in a condition environment that would be most um, um, better for your yourself as an individual, but also for the whole team? Of course. But when it comes to implementing the process and uh, changing the way we used to work for 20, I think the most experienced people at this time was 35 years of experience. One, year, one or two years later, they left. And I think coming with this honesty and open, open minded and accepting that some of, because at the end of the day, we did not implement it, everything that I came with in mind when I joined this team, some have been demonstrated and I was open for the discussion during our debates. They were demonstrated that it was useless and it was technically on paper for a, a doctor from its own lab. It looks really nice, but on site, it will be challenging because we will not be able to provide the required you know, resources or inputs that will uh, make it possible. So coming with honesty, I was, let's say, um, and I think I, I that's the time in my career, I, um, how do you say it? I have been the most challenged. At the end of the day, it was very helpful because it, so it helped me myself to start this process of self-reflection and introspection that until today helped me. Every day I come to UNECA because I decided I wanted to join here because I know the type of impact I could have on people in our continent and how it could be helpful. The day I will not have this type of clear vision of what am I here to contribute to, I think I will not be around. And those type of process and being reiterative, not forgetting that some it's a continuous process is really important. And I'll stop there. Um, it's a really great question. I'm just I'm processing Decker's excellent answer as well. But the I, I like to think that having gone through the experience that I had, that I, I'm I'm more open and understanding and more um, and try to make myself available to listen to everyone, uh, no matter their age, by the way, because I think it is important that I think I think young people sometimes. Uh, from based on my own experience, you you do come in with idealism, and quite and if and and I think where institutionally, not only the UN, all institutions, we have to be careful because that idealism get can get very brutally crushed, and it's about nurturing that idealism, but also understanding that uh, because the thing that I also recall was when I did become minister shortly after. Uh, it also wasn't as straightforward as I imagined it would be, right? Because you've got some fantastic ideas, but then the implementing these ideas, it's as some people take the approach, some leaders take the approach of, I'm the minister, we do it. It's going to fail. The the so so I like to think that, uh, and I think and I don't I think sometimes I, I'm not good enough at it, but uh, that you know trying to create a culture of being open to new ideas, no matter where they may come from. And, but remaining focused nonetheless on core goals, right? Because there has to, you know, we, we, we have to be, um, we have to be, we have to avoid diverting our attention into a million things, because that's also a danger. We have to make sure that there is a common understanding on the goal and
that's what gives me satisfaction. Or, or also, um, when I'm in Seychelles, my home country, there is uh, a fund that I helped set up with a, a debt swap that we did in 2015. And every year, they do a, a call for proposals where uh, where projects are presented for innovations in terms of, and it gives me immense satisfaction when I see, you know, someone has just done a someone has just done a project to use seaweed to try and create an alternative packaging. And when I see things like that, that's what gives me the satisfaction much more than the the fact that I was a minister. And I think, and what I think would be is very interesting going forward is in the work of the UN, for example, how people can derive satisfaction on some of the work that we are doing. Um, so, for example, I think we're in a real moment in terms of carbon markets, as an example. And a lot of that work is being done by individuals within the within the UNECA which can have a huge impact going forward. And I think that that's really, for me, what, what we want to tap into, that motivation of being able to say, well, I've contributed to something which is transformative. Thank you so much, JP. Actually, in fact, uh, I think both you and... Let's maybe it's almost time to either go. Yeah. <laughs> JP has to leave. He had a hard stop at 120, but we still kept him a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really have to go because I'm chairing this next session. I know, I know. So JP has to go, but just to just to mention, I think both of both JP and I, Deca had mentioned uh, something about goal setting and actually bringing people along and all those kind of things. For that, actually, you have to know why you're doing things. So I'm I'm one of those people who concentrates a lot on why I want to do something, yes. not how. Yes. If you know the why, how will come. But if you know the how, why will not necessarily come. And unless you have the why, you know, you can't be convincing to others. So always, I mean, like, you know, my advice always to people is to know the why, why you're doing something. And this is something that actually uh, connected me to Deca when she had just moved to OES and we had our first meeting because as a chief of staff, I meet everybody and she stopped by my office and she told me about why she's doing things and what she, what she wants and what her vision is. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's exactly the kind of attitude you need and why I'm doing something. So thank you, JP, actually for being here, but we'll, we, 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 I know, I know, I know. Thank you so much. Everyone. So, yes. Yeah. We can chat a little bit further. Thanks, JP. Okay. Anybody else? You want to share your experience, questions for Deca and Ling? No, nothing inspiring came out after all. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. I wanted to find out what about the issues which you cannot change. For example, if someone is being, because you mentioned a woman, uh, you are black, if someone is being biased towards a presentation you are given because of your gender or because of your skin color, how do you overcome that? It's a uh, it's something I really wanted to get from you from the after your presentation. Obviously, you might have noticed people were probably just saying no to everything you were doing, probably because you were a woman or because of your skin color. I wanted to find out in certain circumstances like that, how do you how did you navigate your way and what was your immediate response and or what lessons have you learned throughout time? Um, well, I think it's um it's more about, um, you know, I found out that with this team I was working with, with, I thought that we were very far, you know, in terms of background or, but we were sharing more than I thought. And just engaging with them individually and uh, in uh, with uh, taking the time like to interact and listen more about themselves, we found out that first we were sharing the same language, which is not easy. I'm a French speaker at the beginning. And that is the process just to know each other and share our, our culture and what we believe in. And I found out that the, um, some of the outcomes uh, were maybe not presented also in the, in the good way. I was pre presented it from the corporate perspective, showing that we will earn uh, 16 million uh, per year. So how does it impact our life as individual? I mean, not just in, as a person, but even our own environment and just looking at and assessing how it will impact their own, own environment, how it is impacting their communities. For example, one of the products I was recovering from this process is uranium. So it was fueling nuclear central that provided a major, um, big fraction of the energy uh, power in France. And at this moment, just realizing that 
In their sub-region, they had three centers, and just by our project, we will be able to provide the quantity required to fuel, let's say, one, one central, and that will affect hundreds of thousand people. It, you have a different perspective. Say, oh, okay, fine, that's good, because it will impact, it will have good impact on my community. But those approach, I mean, they are not very academic. It requires uh, some strengths and knowing yourself, setting the goals and accepting where you have also, as a human, you need to be tolerant and accept that sometimes you will not reach 100%, you know, coherence. And uh, But you need to, from the moment you have at least one main common goal, then you can join at, uh, you know, at the middle and ensure that you will be delivering this main outcome that will impact people's life at the end. So I think we shared more than I thought at the beginning. And when I left six years later, I think I, I, I earn good friends and I continue to be in contact with. And, and as I said, it's not an easy process. It's a, you need also internally to accept to self-reflect, accept criticism, um, feedbacks that are positive, but also can be negative and be open to, to accept any change that is not aligned with what you suggested yourself, but from your team member. And that looks good. And that's better than what you had in mind. I hope this helped. It's important in change management. That's, Alice, my question is, you, you have touched upon it, but I just want it slightly more specific as to how much persistence is important in change management, because any change management doesn't come easy with the, whatever you really want to do. So how do you deal with that? Well, I think persistence is very key uh, from the moment we have a shared goal and common goal to reach. Of course, we need to always make sure that we look at this common goal and we continuously or persistently uh, try to achieve it. On the way, we can um, go through different you know, roads to achieve this and accept to be open on any matters, process, um, uh, technologies that would be different. But at the end of the day, every time we go through this assessment or monitoring of our change, is it going well? Are we continuing to deliver helps to uh, make sure that we get this persistency and every time reminding ourselves and uh, to our teams that this is hey this is our goal are we still going through this one or are we a little bit deviating from it and let's refocus it and i think this continuous assessment helps to get this um uh, persistence to the main goal from my perspective Go ahead, Marcia. Hi, um, very, very interesting, um, Dekav, uh, and, and I'm really inspired by your presentation um, and JP's as well. And I think my question to you and to others in this uh, discussion is, is what, what do you think of the importance of being in a constant state of readiness? Because change management, you know, you can find yourself in the midst of change, but if you don't, if, and, and there may be ideas and plans and projects you may want to be kicking off, but if you're not ready when the opportunity comes, you know, there's nothing to, you can do about it. But, you know, you have an idea, but you're not, you know, mentally, or you haven't put it down in writing or whatever. I'm, I'm just wondering about that idea of being in a constant state of readiness as an important part of managing change uh, so that when change happens you're ready for whatever you know for whatever you know comes your way um, in a very healthy way and then you can take on whatever direction it's taking and move it in the direction in your you know and have your agenda and your and your and your ideas and you know uh, able to fit within that new environment it's just a question a reflection question question I'm putting out to you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Merci. Well, I would say readiness is not just about ourselves because I believe that everyone is ready to change when it 
could improve our lives of or our communities and people around our lives. But it's about the environment in which we are evolving that normally uh, creates this space to uh, allows you to, to join any change that is suggested. So readiness is about um, being, um, as I said, open-minded, being uh, accepting to be vulnerable, accepting the, the idea of failing, and, uh, and, uh, and also um, being able to trust and rely on the people that run you. That's really important to create this readiness for, uh, for the change man management. And once this environment is, uh, is, is created, really things flows quite naturally. And I, I was impressed at my, at my level, how, um, you know, after the few quick uh, triggers, you know, it um, settled into every day's life and more quickly than I could have ever expected in my, in my plan at the beginning. So of course we need to be ready as individual and that requires some uh, courage to be um, to accept to be in a situation that you could maybe fail but uh, that's also a form of developing your own resilience um i just shared an experience in the private sector where i i felt i felt like i had a success but following this experience have be, i served my own government where i think i have um, I've been through more uh, a more challenging environment, and I was not able to implement any of the great idea I came with once I, I joined. And the agility, and you know, the they were so in so much inertia in the system, inertia in the system that it was quite challenging to to move it the way I, I expected. But then I I had to accept that um, you have different way of doing things, and that's where you develop your resilience. I'm not sure that someone um, that never failed can be able to, 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 to reach this level. So you need to fail. And it was interesting because I think um, at the beginning of, um, at the end of my studies, let's say, uh, I have followed a training a course uh, entitled um, Learn to Fail. At this time I was laughing. I say, why are they are uh, uh, wanting me to fail? Uh, Am I, I need to be in the mindset that I will be prepared to fail. But with now a little bit wisdom and hindsight, I realize how it is also important acceptance of whatever is coming through your life as a success, but also as a failure, because nothing is 100% uh, good to, to take. Thank you, and I hope I helped to interest. It's true. I mean, like, you know, actually uh, coming to... What you're saying, um, you may have lots of ideas, but you can have resistance from the other side. I mean, like, you know, for a change, for a successful, for a good idea to be successful, you need the entire environment. I mean, like the whole paraphernalia where you're working, they have to be open to change as well. Um, and so it takes a lot, actually. Um, as they always say, success is to be in the right place at the right time, right? Because you could have great ideas. She couldn't implement it in her own country where, Racism and, and gender and all those things may not have actually played such a big role, but you, you were able to do it in another environment, right? So it, it, all, it all matters. Anybody else who has any questions for our? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. It's very interesting and uh, well, it brings everything. Yes, change is difficult to, you know, uh, it's not an easy thing. But if it's said in a participatory manner, already you are you know, successful, you know it's going to be implemented. But if you impose, if it's a very good idea, it, can, it has a positive effect on us. But if you impose it, there's always a resistance to change. So I think our tactic needs to be you know, uh, different when we bring change, you know, making people part, uh, uh, participate in that. But the question I have to Ling is that when you change it, you talked about the email. When you send email, you were copying directors, wherever, you know, to get, uh, uh, yeah. But did you get answer before and after, before putting that, ceasing directors and then 
you know, I just, I'm just wondering. Yeah. yeah. So um, the reason why I cited that example is because I actually didn't copy directors. I believe there's better ways to manage it, like you access the need and do you communicate with people, as you say, instead of imposing the ideas, get their opinions, why they want or do not want to do that change, right? So I think that answers your question. Yes, okay. I just wanted to share also my experience. You know, sometimes things become uh, a norm, but that's nothing is written. Somebody created it, then the newcomers follow it up, and then it becomes a norm. Because I was told when I start, you only send email to your peer, not to the director, not above. I was like, what? Yeah. I said, it's the idea, not, not who send it. You can send it, but the thing is the idea and the response that we need and who is relevant person for that. No, 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 no. This is the way. So for me, I just, you know, it was in my mind for a lot of time. And then I questioned, is there a written thing that says you go, you send it to a peer? Apparently there was no written thing. So that means somebody at some point created this kind of thing in his or in her office that it become a knob. So I, I think, uh, you know, when you are new, afterwards, you know, you become normal. Okay, well, I will write to my peer. Okay. But when you are new, coming from a different environment, and when you are told like this, you start questioning, you know, like, what? Really? You know, so uh, sometimes unwritten things become a norm and it follows. So I'd like young people like this. When they come, they will. They come with a new <laughs> approach, and then they change. So, uh, just to share, you know, I also went through that that kind of thing. Yeah, thank you. Fine, Sharon. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much to JP, Becca, and Ling for this really interesting conversation. Um, it was no, really I, great. I saw someone online. Aman. Sharon, I can see her hand. Uh, so I... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can, you... can you hear me? Okay, yes. I had started speaking. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying thank you so much for this really interesting discussion. It's been great to listen to colleagues uh, share their experience. Um, I worked for six years as a change management specialist, so I can relate to a lot of the experiences that have been shared here. And, you know, I kept shaking my head at some of the points that everybody was alluding to, the importance of having the reasons for the change, why we need to change, what's in it for me. I think that can't be overstated. The cultural barriers and the norms that are created that are unwritten, that becomes uh, part of the fiber of an organization. So. For me, I think it's quite heartening to see these pockets of changes happening around um, the office. And it doesn't have to be, you know, to start from the top and big and grand. But I think when we start these pockets of conversations and changes in small places, you know, um, over time, the expectation or the anticipation is that, you know, it, it does then become uh, organic and the whole organization there that goes through a process of change. So I worked, um, uh, for instance, on the whole organizational transformation, looking at business processes, organizational culture, and really embedding new ways of working. Uh, that was in my immediate previous role with the uh, International Labor Organization. And I can attest that change is hard because nobody wants to change it. Everybody wants to change. You know, so it's great to hear um, um, uh, the points being raised here about the importance of keeping in, 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 you know, in mind the culture, keeping in mind the incentives. Why do you need to change? Why do we need to do things differently? And I think at the heart of it, from my experience, it's having that curiosity and challenging the status quo and questioning everything. You know, yes, there are rules and regulations, but those rules and regulations are made by humans. They're made by people. They're, who's the organization? It's people who work in the organization. So if the rules and, and regulations worked 10 years ago, are they fit for purpose now? So starting those questions and those conversations will eventually drive the change. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this uh, session. Thank you. Anybody else here want to share something? Yeah. No? Or maybe we can introduce 
time management as well. Exactly. No, no, no. I just wanted to actually give people a chance to ask a question if they had. No, we are already beyond time. It's supposed to be one hour. Last time it went actually an hour and a half, in fact, actually. So this time we are doing much better on time. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll get to one hour. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and stay tuned for our next one next month uh, in June, our third, third dialogue. Uh, you'll hear from us. Um, so thank you. And if anybody wants to actually share their experience, come on this side of the stage, please, please contact me or contact Martha or Irene, anybody actually. Okay. So we look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye.